Hi, I'm with Randall Connor again, and um, just picking up the interview that uh, we, we started. This is the second part of the extended interview, so make that a third part. <laughs> um, so the so we were talking about the Human Connectome project last time. It seems to be quite popular, um, and you mentioned that it, um, it's uh, an offshoot of the Connectome project is brain emulation or a lot of uh, interest in that and um, so what is the Connectome project and how does it relate to what you're doing? So um, I'm not sure that it's right to call brain emulation an offshoot of the Connectome project. I think it's rather that we've reached a certain point in neuroscience where we've gone from the old neuroscience which was behavioral neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience to computational neuroscience. And once you start doing that at large scale, you get what's called neuroinformatics. And when you've reached that scale, then you become interested in, okay, how can we get very specific details of specific brain circuitry? And that is, you know, really what a connectome is all about. It's how do you find the specific connections between neurons in one particular brain, um, or at least that's what it originally meant. And that is directly applicable to brain emulation. So as soon as you start thinking about that, and you're thinking about making computational versions of that so it can run, then you're talking about emulating brain circuitry. So that's how they're connected. That's how they belong to the same class of this new neuroscience. But um, there are a lot of different interpretations of what connectome really means or uh, how one should take it. So if you speak to the... Um, uh, the purists, uh, which I guess are the ones most um, interested in emulation, like Ken Hayworth, for example, then connectome really means very specific connectivity. What are the synapses connecting one neuron to another neuron in a particular brain? If, though, you look at the Human Connectome Project, for example, then you notice that most of the projects there now are about MRI. They're about uh, tensor diffusion MRI, which is a method of getting um, an idea of many of the pathways in the brain, getting a lot of the sort of fibrous pathways that are there mapped out, but it is not at the level of detail where you would be able to tell this is how one neuron is connected to another, and there certainly aren't that many ways of figuring out how strong those connections would be. So it, it's rather at a different level, not sufficient for an emulation, for example. Okay, yeah, um, I think Kurzweil in his book was saying that um, the way in which we'll achieve uh, a simulation or, or a, a, um, a detailed emulation, emulation being different from simulation, would be um, through having nanotechnological Drexlerian uh, um, microbots sort of inside the brain. Um, mapping from the inside out, and he reckons that would happen about 2030, is that right? I've got it written down somewhere. Mm. What do you think about that? I think that it would be excellent to have those little nanobots that could do those things. How far um, away? It's not the, it's you, not the you work on quite a bit of nanotechnology yourself, or is that more um, material um, sciences? Well, we do call ourselves a nanotechnology company where we are, because we work at that scale. We work with... Uh, specific labels that are, you know, on the angstrom scale, and we work with base distances that are less than a nanometer, so we need to be able to manipulate, identify, uh, arrange things at that scale. But that's not the same, of course, as molecular nanotechnology or building nanomachines, which is a whole order of magnitude more difficult. Um, those would be nice to have. Um, luckily, I don't think that that is what you really need to do uh, the data acquisition for a whole brain emulation. You can probably stay at the, um, you know, at this meso scale that's just above the nano scale. Um, all you need is something that's small enough. Well, okay, now we're going into the into specific technologies. Before I say this, I should say that there's a reason why Carbon Copies calls itself technology agnostic. It's sure. because I think that. In fact, we need to explore a broad variety of different approaches for the data acquisition. Mm -hmm. We can't simply say, oh, I like this particular approach because it happens to be something that I know how to work with or that I think is cool, and so I'm going to charge down that direction. It's much more important to figure out which technologies can really lead to the acquisition of the data that we want, and then to pursue all of those. 
So um, nanotechnology certainly is one of them, um, and something at a slightly larger scale also, but you can also consider methods such as Ken Hayworth's approach of slicing the brain, imaging it, and then reconstructing from that image, and figuring out what the mapping from structure to function is, um, and, and a variety of other approaches. But it would be nice, for instance, to have probes that are small enough that you don't need to stick large electrodes into the brain, but instead you have probes small enough to travel through the capillary system, through the, the vasculature that provides nutrients to all of the neurons in the brain. You can reach every single neuron that way. And they wouldn't have to be at the nanoscale. Um, a, a red blood cell has a diameter of eight, about eight microns, so that's uh, considerably larger than the nanoscale. Um, those sort of approaches, I think, are more near-term than the molecular nanotechnology approach that Kurzweil is talking about. So then we're talking about things that are being developed right now, so that are being that are in the works and that would be, uh, you know, usable within say ten years. Uh, and that's why last time when we spoke, I said if you ask me today, I would say that yeah, this is you know it's really around on the horizon. It's right here. We can produce these things. Um, and previously I might not have, but I happen to know now that there are people working on these projects. Is the human it's the connectome project funded or is it um, more like a just a conglomeration of interested parties working uh, and building up building it ground up like a wiki of information? So there are a variety of different projects to keep an eye on. Uh, there is the Human Connectome Project, which is an NIH funded or at least it is something that is funded by a variety of grants provided by the NIH to specific researchers. Then there is the Open Connectome Project, which is something that's much more, um, I guess, it's open. So, you know, it, it, there's more access by everyone for everyone, but it isn't as well organized in the sense that it is dominated by government grants coming in from one side and not just for one purpose. Um, and then on the other hand, you've got the European approach, which is they've got this flagship proposal that I think is in the process where it's reaching usability uh, called the Human Brain Project, I believe it is. And uh, a main player in that, for instance, is Henry Markram. So we know him already from the Blue Brain Project. And he's probably going to be one of the beneficiaries of it as well. So hopefully that would help him move forward. Mm. Henry Markram, yes. Um, it, it, I think he's mentioned as uh, having like a changed his sort of optimism over time. He was, you know, a little bit optimistic about uh, brain emulation like years back, I think in 2002 or four or something like that. Then just recently, because he's noted a lot of uh, progress in um, these areas, he's sort of seemed to be a little bit more optimistic. I read somewhere anyway. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Um, yeah, so the Connectome projects are, uh, there's three major ones, the Connectome project, the Open Connectome project, and the Human Brain project. Interesting, okay. So um, now you, you were uh, on the board of uh, road mapping sort of uh, initiative for substrate independent minds, or originally one of the founding um, people. Yeah, the, the, um, do you mean the whole brain emulation roadmap back from 2007? Oh, okay, yes, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We were uh, called to a workshop in Oxford and discussed a variety of ways to do whole brain emulation, but but it was all very much focused on this uh, this approach, mostly the structural approach. How do you slice something up, and how do you emulate after you've reconstructed that? Um, and so we did a number of calculations to figure out how long would it, would it take uh, using conventional computers to get to the level where you'd be able to do that, and. Uh, what sort of technologies do you need for the data acquisition? What do we have now? How long will it take? It was mostly an attempt by the um, Future of Humanity um, Institute, the Institute for the Future of Humanity, or I forget which way yeah, around it is. Boston and Anders Sandberg, yeah. to, to get a handle on, on those kinds of bits of data. And uh, they produced that roadmap, though I'm not sure that roadmap is the right word for it. It's more like a report, hmm. uh, just for that approach. Um, okay. It's actually, a, there is a larger roadmap in the works, one that covers a variety of different approaches and updated to the current time, but that's not ready yet. Oh, okay. Uh, when will that be ready, it's, do, you, do you think? Uh, sometime in the middle of 2012 is my assumption. Interesting. Wow. Nice. 
So um, it, it's interesting to think about the roadmaps and what they're focusing on. I mean, if you were going to uh, be building like a specific path, how would, would you, I mean, would you be focusing on the regions that um, contain, you know, the sense of self, the personality um, and whatever skills and learnings we've achieved over our lifetime? Or would you be going for the whole kit and caboodle? I think I'd go for the whole kit and caboodle because um, at present, uh, since the only method that we know how to handle is the one where we reconstruct neuroanatomy and neurophysiology to a great degree, then doing a part of the brain uh, is not fundamentally different than doing the entire brain. It's just a matter of scaling it up by a couple of factors. So let's say that you're going to go for a region that is as small as an orange, and then you want to do the entire brain. Well, you make it 10 times as large, so 10 times as much data acquisition, 10 times as much emulation. That's you know not fundamentally more complicated. Um, so in that case, yeah. But, uh, but I would start first with much smaller goals, actually. I think that uh, it's quite worthwhile to look at small animals, um, which is why I think that uh, David Dalrymple's attempt right now to use C. elegans as his model for um, his thesis to do David organization who? of C. elegans. David Dalrymple. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I think it's worthwhile because he's at least tackling a specific hypothesis. He wants to knock down one of the pegs. People are asking, of course, um, what is the resolution that you need to get to? What do you need to emulate and what don't you need to emulate? And so he's simply come up with a hypothesis and said, okay, I'll say that we do not need to go to the molecular level. Getting the functional uh, simulation or emulation of the spiking neurons, and actually they're not even spiking, in C. elegans it's just sub-threshold activity of the neurons. Getting that and describing it properly is sufficient to do an emulation of a specific C. elegans. If his thesis shows that this is not true, okay, then we've learned something. If it shows that it is true, then I'm assuming that people will go to the next level and say, okay, so that works for C. elegans, but how about a mammal. It may not be true for a mammal. So then, you know, the stakes go up. But that's fine. You know, that's how you how you do science. You approach one hypothesis and you try to answer that one and then you go for the next one. And this way you tackle the actual problems rather than just standing there and saying, well, we think we could do emulation if only we knew, you know, what the scope and what the resolution have to be and what things we need to acquire. So I like very specific experiments like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if 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 people are going to be um, you know attempting to approach the Bekenstein bound, that's um, that's an upper limit of information that can be contained within a finite region of space, which has a finite amount of energy, or conversely, the maximum amount of information required to perfectly describe a given physical system down to the quantum level. Um, I read this just on Wikipedia and the mathematics is a bit sort of above my head because I didn't do complex maths. Um, so it's it, like uh, the idea is that it, for a whole brain, it would be, uh, I think, what was it, Beckenstein bound. Yeah. For human but brain, it would be 10 <clears throat> to the power of 7 point... Right. 10, 10 to the power of 41. 10 to the power uh, of 41. It's uh, 100 times 10 to the 41, so it's about 10 to yeah. the power of 43, in fact. Um, mm. That's huge. That's enormous. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you, it, it's also quite silly, because um, why would you want to do that kind of emulation down to the quantum level? I mean, do you really care about all those tiny details? It's, it's not clear that you do. This is exactly why the sort of research that David Dalrymple is doing is important. Uh, it's like my analogy that I made last time we spoke about emulating a PC or something like that and not really caring about some of the aspects of that emulation, like where exactly are the electrons shuttling along and what sort of parts of your environment are they heating up in the process. All that you care about is how that program is being run. And in the same way, there are certain things that you care about when you're doing an emulation of a person's mind or identity. And there are some things that we simply don't care about. Like right now, I don't actually care which neurons are processing what I'm thinking. And I don't care whether some of their atoms are being replaced while I'm sitting here speaking to you, or if some of them are dying, as long as my thoughts continue. 
So it's clear that that, that Beacon's time bound, I don't think that that's, uh, you know, that's not what you're aiming for. It's, that's, that's ridiculously high. Maybe in a thousand years, <laughs> who knows? Um, but yeah, it's it's it just seems like one of those um, un un unachievable sort of uh, milestones at this point, and and that brings into question. Uh, I've had some questions from um, that keep on coming up by, by one particular person in Australia, Colin Klein. Hello, if you're watching, <laughs> he likes to ask things like some people have concerns. Oh. Actually, this is not his question. I'm just stipulating that some people have concerns that simulated intelligence or AI will um, have roadblocks um, in because it's just computationally infeasible. Um, so how would you respond to this? I mean, partly I think you've responded in the in the last few last few paragraphs of what you've said, but how would you specifically respond to the um, the possible computational infeasibility of simulated or we know for a fact that um, computing thinking in a brain is feasible and there are at least seven billion pieces of evidence walking around on this earth. Uh, we all have a brain, it's a piece of biological machinery and it does exactly those computations. Therefore we know it is feasible. That's right, an existence proof. This but, is um, the nice thing these kinds of research that we already see the evidence around us <laughs> interpreting the evidence um, well for instance uh, people suggest that um, von, von Neumann architecture is not sufficient for um, parallel processing that the brain does but well strictly speaking a von Neumann process if you look at exactly what it is cannot do any parallel processing that's right because a von Neumann process is just one processing element, it has a bunch of operations it can carry out in a long tape, basically an infinite tape, if it's an ideal von Neumann type of computer. Um, so yeah, that's probably true. But then again, I mean, even for our, our daily uh, you know, word processing nowadays, we've decided that that kind of a von Neumann process is not good enough, so we have multiple cores in our machines. So we're already heading in the direction of having parallel processors and other kinds of architectures. I think it's not at all bizarre to believe that we would use some sort of neuromorphic architecture to run something like a brain emulation. Hmm. With that being said, I think, I correct me if I'm wrong, that there's nothing outside of some weird quantum stuff that um, von Neumann architecture cannot do that parallel processing um, can do. Uh, except that's run. Absolutely true. Yes, yeah, there, that's absolutely that right? true. I mean, this is the whole notion of the um, yeah of things being computable and other anything computable being computable on such a processor um, of course that doesn't mean that it's feasible yes because first of all we don't have infinite tapes mm -hmm. and uh, yeah secondly we don't have infinite time to wait for things to be done mm -hmm. uh, so that's not really what we'd like to see mm. and the other question that um that Kevin Korb from Monash University wanted to ask is how would how would you deal with the software engineering side of the simulation? That's a direct quote. Hmm. Well, I guess it depends on the hardware you're targeting, right? Um, right now, since we're really just doing things on regular computing architectures, what it comes down to is you know you're just programming in a regular language like C plus plus, maybe using an environment that's built around it, like uh, the neuron simulating environment uh, uh, and then implementing the bits and pieces of data that you've been able to acquire from the system. That's what computational neuroscientists do. Uh, so in principle that should be enough to build an emulation but if you want to make something that is so huge then you can't do it the old-fashioned way. You need to automate a lot. So you basically need to come up with ways to acquire a lot of data in exactly the same way to do mappings to function in exactly the same way and to automatically process what sort of a program is supposed to come out of that. So you set up your classes, you set up your, your data structures, mm. um, even if you're using a, a classical approach to computing. Um, so that would require a lot of work and I think we haven't even begun to look at that simply because the acquisition side is so complicated and is really the hurdle right now. It's the fact that this biological brain is not naturally accessible. We can't really get at the data that easily. No that's the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. 
putting it into a computer afterwards certainly is also a huge effort and it requires a lot of engineering but it's something that we sort of know how to tackle in the sense that we've done large-scale computation and, and building of computer programs so I'm sure it's yeah it's going to take a while to make something effective come out of there as well so the real hurdle at the moment is just proper mapping and understanding really generating some sort of yeah. Yeah, if we had all the data that we wanted from a brain, then yes, we could look at how do you implement this, what is the software problem, the software side of that. And uh, I don't mind looking at it before then. I'm, I'm really not against doing a lot of things in parallel because we have a lot of people, a lot of interested people who have different special uh, skills, expertise. Many are not neuroscientists, but many are computer engineers or software engineers. Um, and they may as well work on that problem. I, that's, that's not wrong. In fact, I think it's a good thing to parallelize all that. Okay. Yeah, that was another yeah. question I had. Um, yeah, would, would it would you only be focusing on subneural details um, or reasons regions that are responsible for certain functions, and would you be sort of pre-compiling and having pluggable, pluggable AI sort of modules or whatnot to help um, deal with some of the more um, simple or automated tasks that aren't necessarily directly coupled or <clears throat> tightly integrated into what makes us us. Or... I think that sort of goes back to something else that we talked about before. In fact, it goes to two topics. One of them was this issue of emulation versus compilation, that you mm. can compile the code into something that is more suitable for the framework that you're going to be working on mm. when you understand enough about it so that yeah. you feel that by compiling it, you're not losing the essence of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, yes, if you're talking about some specialized AI component doing something for you, that's like compiling it. That's like compiling a piece rather than taking an emulation of everything that's going on in the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. Then there's that other issue of what does it take to be you? Uh, so which parts do you need? Uh, how much do you need? Does it need to be just as if all you're doing is replacing uh, the prefrontal cortex and all the cortical areas, maybe the uh, cerebellum, etc., the brainstem, and then connect all that with all your senses and motor areas so that it is a complete environment that you have that's exactly the same that you have right now, except that your brain has been replaced. Maybe do that in some other form, maybe robotic, maybe virtual, whichever. Does it? Do you need all that, or do you need less? So. While I was talking about the resolution issue before, when I referenced David Dalrymple's work, the scope issue is also one that needs to be addressed. How much is enough? And these questions come up all the time. And then, you know, you, you have people who've lost limbs but who still feel like themselves. So you might posit that, okay, you don't need all the parts of your body, but is it really good or does it change you in some sense? How about people who are, have locked in syndrome or are basically living in that diving bell? I mean, if you remember this. Uh, novel about uh, the butterfly and the diving bell, then um, the question is how much of oneself is still there, how much isn't when you're just imagining everything else that's going on, when you're just dreaming it or being able to communicate through eye blinks but nothing else. Um, yeah, so it's an unsolved question. I think ideally we would like to just basically have uh, exactly what we are and then work from there beyond to get to something even better, something more, improve that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what the first kinds of uploads in that sense, emulations would look like. I'm quite curious uh, what would be acceptable to to someone in an early phase upload like that. Yeah, right, it's yeah, interesting. So. Early phase, I don't know if I want to be one of the first. but Yeah, that's a tricky question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, would you want to volunteer for something like that even if it could save your life <laughs> yeah well if, if, if it was the only option <laughs> yeah well in, in a sense like um, I feel as though I've sort of uploaded a lot of um, my meta information about myself onto digital devices my phone the internet my email accounts and all my online activity and, and offline activity on my hard drives and written pieces of stuff um, I just I was asking myself a question while you were answering that. If I had a choice to lose, you know, a, a small appendage of my body, like you know, some toes or a little finger, uh, 
and choose between that or all my online information and all my data, um, I'm not sure what I'd choose. The difference is with my data, at least I can back it up. At the moment, we don't have any ways to regrow limbs. Um, <laughs> yes. That's yeah. true. Yep. That so still a, matters, yes. So in but a sense, again, you, didn't, you didn't say that you were allowed to back it up before they would wipe up. No, no, no. That's not part of the thought of the experiment. No, no backups. Just complete loss. If you had the, if you let me ask you this question, Ryan. If you had the choice between lo losing your left little finger, or mm -hmm. are you left-handed? I don't know. Or uh, I'm right, luckily. <laughs> so okay. left finger, well, not so bad. Okay. <laughs> Does it, just, just it's it's not a a major appendage. Just. Yeah. Or lose all the information online or digital content you've created, all of it, with no it's, chance of it being recovered. I, I think just because there's so much that I'm trying to keep track of online, including project stuff, and I could never recreate all that. So, yeah, the finger would have to go. <laughs> it's morbid, isn't it? But <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Um, okay. Well... It's interesting. We were talking about different parts of the brain being um, uh, recreated or modularized. Uh, a couple of interesting uh, art, um, things have popped up in the news. Um, you were, I think, last time we were speaking about uh, an artificial cerebellum and an artificial hippocampus. So um, the artificial hippocampus has been worked on for a while by Theodore Berger, and um, you know a bit about that. Would you like to um, comment on? what he's doing. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that it's not really an artificial hippocampus. It's an artificial slice of a piece of a hippocampus. There's a subregion called CA3, and he's able to simulate how that bit of the brain works. Um, what he does is he treats it as a black box, records the input to that black box and the output to that black box, and then trains his chip to behave the same way. And then one of the really difficult and also fascinating things is to have an electrode array that you can actually attach there so that you can receive those inputs, do the computation on the chip, and provide the necessary output so that you're replacing the function of that slice. Uh, that's definitely non-trivial. Um, he picked an area of the brain that is suitable for that, just like the cerebellum was also picked for a specific reason. Because the hippocampus and the CA3 region, they don't carry out um, functions that uh, carry unique information that needs to be stored permanently. Instead, they process information. They, they can turn new sensory data, new uh, contextual information into an episodic sequence that you can then store elsewhere in the brain. And the neurons in there are reused for different purposes. So it's kind of like just a standard type processing system that, that that you could replace and reuse. It's not as if you had a piece of your brain where you're actually storing memories of your grandmother, and if it were destroyed, then well, how would you put a chip in that replaces those memories? That information would be gone. You can't simply replace that. Um, but in the case of the hippocampus, it's kind of you know something that is just in the track. It, things come through, and you can use it that way. There's still an issue, though, that if you use the black box approach, um, where you're just doing the functional I.O. mapping and you're coming up with the right transfer function, then the transfer functions that you discover are just those that you can infer from the input activity and the output activity that you've seen during the time when you're carrying out the experiment. Now, that's usually a fairly short time compared to, for example, the lifespan of a human being. So if you're trying to do this kind of mapping for a complex part of the brain, you could very well miss intrinsic functions that are implicit in that area that exist because of the connectivity that's within the area that just didn't happen to get activated, that were not used during that period while you're observing it. That's the reason why the kind of connectome mapping that Ken Hayworth is uh, particularly interested in is useful because mapping those and then doing a transfer from that structure to function should in principle give you all those latent functions as well if you're doing the mapping correctly. Both methods have their problems. The functional approach has the problem that it only grasps that which it happens to see because it's active. And the structural approach has the problem that it needs to do that perfect mapping between structure and function. So ideally, you want to be able to detect both to make a good map. 
other than that, I think that Theodore's work is fantastic. He uh, used to be part of this organization called the Inner Space Foundation, um, which also Henry, uh, Henry Markham was a member of, and I was a member of, and then numerous other people that uh, were interested in not just how do you cure disease, how do you fix things, but how do you also achieve uh, improvements, augmentation, neural interfaces, things like that. Um, unfortunately, that organization doesn't exist anymore, but it has managed to put together an interesting network of people so that we all know each other. The cerebellum stuff, that's new to me in the sense that I didn't know the people working on that. Um, it's similar in its approach. It also looks at it as a black box and does this kind of mapping. From the abstract that I've seen, I couldn't really tell how much they've done in terms of replacing the cerebellum. It could be that they just found uh, the nerves that connect with a necessary motor response with that blink and that they found the nerves that connect to the sensory input that they require and that they found a good way of mapping the input to the output there but that the rest of the cerebellum wasn't really replaced. I'm not sure if that's the case. I don't know. And I hope that if they do present their work at the neuroscience conference that I'll find out when I'm there. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting development indeed. Yeah, it's um. I think part of the medical reason they want to sort of um, help treat Alzheimer's and things like that, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but they, they've got a rat, like a cyborg rat who put its paw up and said, hey, I want to replace my cerebellum, so let's do that. And they did, and he did. So. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's where I'm wondering exactly how much of the function that the cerebellum was doing for that rat was replaced. I mean, we know that they trained it with the eye blink response, but is the eye blink response the only thing it could do? Or is there more? It's interesting to find out just how big was this connection they made on the input and the output side of the cerebellum, and how large was the transfer functions that they've been able to map there. Because I know from Theodore Berger's work that it's quite difficult to get a lot in there. For instance, even Theodore has often only used, say, 16 to 64 inputs and an equivalent number of outputs. And you can imagine that compared to the millions of fibers that are running through this area in a brain, that's not very much. So even then, it's a very rough type of uh, replacement uh, you know, as, as a neuroprosthesis. Yes. So I'm wondering how this artificial cerebellum works. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, there's um, been like prizes to motivate uh, development in this area. One of them was the Brain Preservation Technology Prize. Um, mm. That's a generator, a brain map of map to reboot in a virtual environment. There are other prizes that I don't remember the names of. Um, uh, so that prize that you just mentioned, it sounds extraordinarily similar to the prize that, um, that Ken Hayworth is in charge of, but okay. it seems that you describe it differently. Hmm. Brain Preservation Prize? Yeah. Brain Preservation Technology Prize. Mm. Okay, I didn't know about the technology part, but anyway, he's always been talking to me about it as the Brain Preservation Prize. Oh, Do you know okay. if this is the one run by James, John Smart and Ken Hayworth that you're talking about? Um, could be, actually. It, yeah, I, I, I didn't get, well, I didn't know about it before. I, I actually got to meet John Smart when I was in Melbourne. I did an interview with him while I was here, so... Um, yeah, very interesting guys. So, so is, if it is that experiment, uh, that prize, then that prize is really just about the preservation of pieces of brain tissue to make them uh, preserve the ultra structure that you require for the kind of uh, scan and reconstruction that would be necessary for an emulation, which is, of course, of extreme interest to Ken Hayworth, which is why he made that prize. And just, you might be interested to know that um, we've agreed actually to help him do the evaluation of that prize, so to do the, the uh, electron microscopy work to, to evaluate the samples that are coming through there. Sure. I've just done a Google and it looks as though it is. This is Ken Hayworth left. So um, in some places I've mentioned it as the Brain Fed Preservation Technology Prize, a proposal for immortality in the question. Um, so yeah, this is on the Singularity Hub. I actually read, read it somewhere else, so I guess it's the same thing. It's mentioned in Hayworth. Yeah, interesting. So, what what do you think about the these prices? Are are they good motivators for um, general development towards? Yeah, I, I think they are in a sense. I mean, obviously, none of these prizes ever give you a prize that is anywhere near the expenditure to work on them. It's the same with the uh, X prize in you know in genomics. Um, but the thing is that they highlight very specific problems. They tell you, okay, this is an area where we haven't got a perfect solution for what we're looking for. 
and hey, who's got something? Who would like to contribute to this? So if you make a prize like that, then you get a focused attention on a very specific problem. And I think that's useful. That's interesting. Well, do you think we'll have pluggable skills like Neo's um, sort of assimilating all the Kung Fu knowledge in the movie Matrix? Eventually, certainly. Um, right now, I think for us the main problem would be how do you integrate external knowledge with the way knowledge is represented in the brain? Because we don't understand very much about it. For instance, it would be quite easy to take uh, data from, say, Wikipedia and provide it in a manner that's more direct than having to read it off of the Wikipedia page. We could, for example, have it play on your retina or play on your optic nerve or further back in your visual system, um, maybe as an auditory signal. Still, besides bringing it a little bit closer along the sensory pathway, uh, we don't really know how to take that and convert it to a format where it would be immediately uh, written into your memory. That's something that we still need to figure out how to do. But eventually, yes, we would be able to do that. Obviously, we could turn this around and say that you know, whole brain emulation and having actual access to everything that's going on in the brain and being able to observe how data that comes in becomes stored would help us solve this much quicker. True. Yes. Uh, yeah, but I mean, wouldn't that be putting the horse, the cart before the horse? Well, not really, because the thing is that you could do whole brain emulation before you understand all these fundamentals about the storage of information in the brain as long as you know what each individual component does and which components you need to copy. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. part of the reason why I said everyone I know right now is working on this whole brain emulation approach to substrate in independent minds because there you can do it without the full understanding. But of course ideally you would like to understand more and then you could do compilation rather than emulation because then you know how you get information into what we consider our mind and how it needs to be processed so that we feel that we're thinking Okay. Um, well, there's been uh, some legal sort of queries around uh, uploaded minds or even semi-uploaded minds and the whole lack of precedent for this sort of thing. Um, but do you think there'll be uh, much of a, a battle in the legal system at the time that we'll, we have this sort of phenomena going on, people being sort of brought back from a suspended state in virtual reality? Will they have well, human rights? I'm, I'm, yeah, human rights. I, I guess that is a big question. How does that? How does this process uh, go? Because I would like to just say that okay, these technologies take a while to ripen, so it's very gradual. And while we go along, we're going to bump into various legal issues and solve them along the way. And then, so by the time we have full uploading, then that will all be solved. Of course, that's not necessarily the way it goes, since the legal system is notoriously very, very slow at adapting to things. So um, that might still become a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see how one could possibly deny um, the same rights to an emulated being as one would give to the original biological being, since we don't take away the rights of persons who have cochlear implants or, you know, any other prostheses. So what if the prosthetic happens to replace your entire brain? What's mm. the big difference? That's true. Um, I guess I remember watching um, Bicentennial Man and the whole reason why the poor robot android thing that replaced every part of the body except its brain with a human brain um, was denied human rights because he didn't have a, an organic sort of thinking module <laughs> yeah, but that's science fiction, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't make actual sense when you think about it, but unfortunately, sometimes there are very nonsensical things going on in the legal system, so this is no assurance that everything will go off just fine. Um, it's worth keeping an eye on. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, so there's a, there is a question of identity that comes up. There's a couple of thought of uh, thought experiments, but just to start with, a brain simulation can be started, paused, backed up, and rerun from a saved backup state at any time. Simulated mind sees the world in slow motion, perhaps, um, or moving fast, and the physical form could see a simulation as running extremely fast, a simulated mind as running extremely fast, or really slow, 
Um, and I thought it interesting to think that if we did have our digital twins or digital sort of selves um, running at different speeds, how would we cope with that? <laughs> Cope in what sense? How would we oh, communicate with them, or what is it? Would it word? work? I mean, it's the first question. Would it work? Uh, let's just say um, the the digital twin, um, the cyber self, uh, wasn't just you know information stored on the internet or stored in a cloud about us, but was actually modular and thinking um, in a sense, and we could sort of transfer information between the two selves and maybe even one day get more articulate and sort of sense what the other is doing in a sense it was like a consciousness extension maybe that's going too far i don't know um but yeah i just thought it would be interesting to to think well in the long run i guess the simulated version could be a lot quicker um and that would maybe look at the 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 initial meat bag sort of person who was originally in control and, and sort of say, well, you know, this core is a little bit slow. It's a bit of a bottleneck and it's trying to, you know, take over too much responsibility. What will we do with it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what would you do with it? Um, I, I mean, eventually, of course, we have to struggle with that problem regardless of whether there is a difference in speed, right? Because the biological um, original self can't last forever. It can't last, I mean, I'm not saying that the other one can last forever, but it may last a lot longer, especially if you can migrate to new upgrades, and et cetera. Sure. Um, so you do reach that point, even in the gradual, fully connected version of how you would upload to a substrate independent mind, where you need to decide, well, how do you transition to being entirely without that biological self and what happens to it? Um, Often we've just treated that as a problem of what happens during biological death, uh, as that separates, is that okay? Uh, and then generally you would say yes, because if we have the same situation as with the two engines on the plane and one of them drops out, but they're basically carrying out the same function, then it would simply seem as if nothing had happened, as if nothing had disappeared. Now in the case where one of them is actually working differently because it's much faster than the other, then you already have a problem because they're really not the same person they're not identical. If one of them is experiencing the world at a much slower rate than the other, they're not the same system. It's not simply redundancy. You've got two different individuals there. Uh, so then it's a case of two individuals who are closely connected. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's that's in a whole... I don't exactly know what to say about that. I don't know yeah, what the problem either. would be like, but I do know that it is a different kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And what, what comes to mind is uh, Marvin Minsky's sort of description of the mind as the society of mind, even our own brains, like there's several modules that are sent, maybe don't have a sense of self, maybe they do, yeah. we don't know. Um, it would be kind of crazy if it did, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so in a sense, like, I can, I can imagine that there'd be a possibility which we could extend a self onto... Yeah the internet or to some other module which is outside the original core or the, of the brain um, and have that work in parallel uh, much like that there's things going on inside our head in parallel um, but how it's, I certainly don't think there's anything fundamentally impossible about that and I think it's also quite natural to think of um, networks and group organizations as being something that occurs at many different scales even just from the atomic scale up to the molecular scale and from the molecular scale to the cellular and between cells so that you have networks of neurons and the neurons belonging to different modules and those modules working together to create what we call the brain and the, that being what the mind emerges from. And then from there, even now in our society, just through the connection of various different individuals at different scales, your, your local tribe and your larger tribe, your, your, I guess, nation and whatever else is important to you, um, and yes, I, I could see that you could extend this feeling, this sense of self um, to something larger, uh, to have a greater group identity in some form. Mm. Uh, I, I think that's perfectly possible. I, again, it's one of those unexplored areas where it sounds fantastic, but I, I just haven't had the time to wrap my mind around it a lot because the actual it's practical so issues of how to acquire data out of the brain are just so glaring, they need to be dealt with first, sure. and, and that's sure. really what takes most of the time.
Mm, yeah, it's interesting. But um, has there ever been any experiments on Siamese twins who have um, who are connected at the head, who have brain regions which are very close? I don't think there's any been any Siamese twin which would operate where there's shared brain. <laughs> but I, I magnetic activity that's... between the two, I don't yeah. know. I do know that there there are cases where there were shared brain regions, or at least very strong connections between brain regions. I believe so, yeah. There was at least, I remember there being something like that, but I don't recall really? what had ever been done in terms of any kind of psychological exploration of what this is like for them while connected or when disconnected. Mm. I don't recall if that ever happened. And don't, you know, I mean... I, I'm not sure about this, so hmm. that's just something I, I, I recall somewhere, seeing that somewhere in a news report, but uh, and I have no idea what was ever done with that. I think in those cases right now, people are mostly concerned with, well, the, just the general health and well-being of the sure. individuals involved and how do you get them to survive some kind of separation operation and hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. Hmm. It's an interesting thing to think about. Um, talking about, uh, like, uploading... Um, this sort of swamp man philosophical sort of thought experiment can be kicked around and, and such and we can sort of treat it like an instantaneous upload destroying of the original um, and then there's a yeah. copy so for those who don't know what the thought experiment is I've actually got um, some text I'm going to just read it really quickly so the swamp man thought experiment is a philosophical thought experiment introduced by Donald Davidson in 1987 in a paper knowing one's mind um, knowing one's own mind and it runs as follows Suppose Davidson goes hiking in a swamp and is struck and killed by a lightning bolt at the same time nearby in the swamp another lightning bolt it spontaneously rearranges a bunch of molecules such that entirely by coincidence they take on exactly the same form that Davidson's body had at the moment he altered untimely death the moment of his untimely death this being whom Davidson terms swamp man has, of course, a brain in which is structurally identical to that which Davidson had, and will thus presumably behave exactly as Davidson should have. He will walk around the swamp, return to Davidson's office at Berkeley, and write the same essays he would have written. He will interact like an amicable person with all of Davidson's friends and family, and so forth. So that's the thought experiment. Um, yeah, so what? It, what's your takes on that? Um, do you, I'll, I'll ask, ask a question. Does it matter what, if you are uploaded without a causal history or some kind of continuum and just appear sufficiently to be random? Oh, sorry, Randall. Um, uh, so if you were... Yeah, I, I have absolutely no evidence, of course, that that's mm -hmm. not exactly what's going on right now, right? Yeah. I mean, I could have been instantaneously created one second ago with all my memories intact. Mm -hmm. There's no way of telling. I just can't tell. So the question, looking from the post-event um, person, is of course kind of moot. It's like, this is your memories, this is who you think you are, and that's your identity. And you continue like that, it does not matter how you got there. Mm -hmm. For the post-identity, I don't see a problem. The only problem there might be, and this is that issue we talked about last time about continuity, is um, how about, you know, the, the person that you are before this event and that process that gets you from before to after, does it matter how this occurs? Does that have some impact on the uh, continuation versus termination of the identity, the self, the self-awareness that you were before the event? And uh, yeah, that is still an open question because uh, nobody really knows whether our feeling of, self, of identity, of self, is something that's yeah, that depends on this kind of continuity, on, on this sort of, some sort of strong connection like that, or if it's just a matter of something that momentarily emerges from your memories and from the activity that's there and has no, no relation to any real previous, any past or anything like that. And actually, I think that if you were to look at it purely physically, just as, as a, without emotional attachment to it, then you would have to say that there's a lot to that second argument, that there's really no, no reason why the past should matter in that sense. Um, but because we discussed earlier Max Moore's argument about how much change can you actually sustain without losing who you are, losing your identity, um, I think that 
that's why gradual approaches seem safer because in this case for instance in the, the swamp man case you have a swamp man being reconstructed in a slightly different location in the swamp and just by doing that it may be that that is so much changed that there isn't that amount of sameness that recognizable sameness that you would call okay having survived I'm not sure about that this is um, yeah that goes back to my being a fence sitter on that issue and mm -hmm. never having been quite sure whether I was in one camp or the other mm -hmm. just because this is such a complicated question in a sense and, and an emotional question as well um, I've always favored approaches that would try to avoid bumping into that problem directly uh, but I can't say that they're actually necessary I don't have any proof or evidence that that is true so you'll just have to chalk me up as still not knowing any more about this than you do um, except that I like Max Moore's approach to looking at the problem of identity same yeah I guess that's much closer to the ship of thesis thought experiment which is um, basically a, a ship which gets gradually replaced so yeah it's um, a Greek sort of mythology mm -hmm. um, so it's the thesis paradox so it, it's um, it raises a question of whether an object has all its component parts replaced remains fundamentally the same object so in uploading if we <coughs> replaced each cell with um, a nanotechnological device bit by bit which functioned exactly the same as the original cell would we remain um, would we maintain that continuum um, it's a very good question yeah I mean uh, it basically asks if you were to replace every bit of yourself one at a time at which point might you be lost uh, is there such a point where you would suddenly be lost or would you gradually be lost what does it mean and how does it compare with the gradual replacement of cells that occur in our body anyhow or with, of atoms that are changing constantly? Um, cell death in the brain is very common. So, and there's also neurogenesis going on all the time and rewiring, which is fundamental to the brain, the fact that we can plastically modify it. So given that all of this is going on all the time, we already face that problem all right now. I mean are we the same person as we were five years ago? Is this still the same identity? And what does that mean in terms of the gradual steps that brought me from there to here? Did I get lost somewhere along the way? Or does that have no meaning? My feeling is that in this case, certainly, whether or not we care or worry about that problem, the gradual in-place replacement in a a substrate in, to a substrate independent mind is not really any different than that. It's not substantively different than this gradual process of change that goes on within us all the time. So we either worry about both of them or we worry about neither of them. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, all right, so I, I wanted to also talk about the history of the idea of um, mind uploading. Now, you've been involved in this for quite some time. I did a little bit of scouring of the internet and came up with the Mind Uploading homepage, which was originally <laughs> created in 1992. Um, so it's gone through some changes, obviously. But um, yeah, um, have you got any any anything to add to the history of the idea of mind uploading? Oh, yes, sure. Yeah. So I mean, uh, the idea has been around quite a bit longer. The group that was involved with that uploading page and then with an affiliated uh, mailing list called the Mind Uploading Research Group. Yeah. Um, was active since about 1992 and I joined that around 1994 even though I was already independently thinking about and working on this idea quite a, for quite a while. In fact, I, I, I started thinking about it and actively wanting to achieve it when I was 13, so that's, you know, we're going way back. Um, mm -hmm. And it was because I was inspired by a novel that I'd read and the novel was by Arthur C. Clarke mm -hmm. and it was called the city and the stars and it's a story that if you look back to the original version the original slightly I think it had a slightly different title a different uh, version of that story was written back in the late 40s so the concept of being digitized entering a computer 
and then being re-emerging, being reconstituted into a thinking being has been around for quite a long time, even in a form that is so recognizably the same idea that you can say, oh yes, what Arthur C. Clarke was talking about is actually what we're thinking about right now. And so the idea is quite old. The name, of course, has changed over time. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so since 1992, uh, what, uh, so, what what inspired the you to create the um, you, your organisation uh, the the carbon copies organisation and where did that first come from? Yeah, so at first I was running the mindaploading.org right. um, website and the associated lists that were going on there, which was really a continuation of Joe Strout's page. Um, but I realised after a while that I needed to come up with a more concrete roadmap and plan of how you would get people to work together on this problem and mostly to identify key pieces of the puzzle that no one was tackling and how to get people to work on those. So for that there was a, a large plan that I'm not going to go into uh, that involves multiple different types of organizations and uh, levels of organizing with people. Uh, one part of that was carbon copies because carbon copies uh, takes care of the issue of first of all going out there and trying to explain the fundamentals of what substrate independent mines are about to people, keeping in touch with a network and gathering a larger network of persons who are interested in the topic and who can work together, um, and building up a literature around it, as well as carrying out a few events that, uh, that do public outreach, etc. So it's really the public face of this new field and a way of combining people's forces. Plus, because it's non-profit and it's completely independent from any other organization or company around it, it doesn't have those burdens of, say, being commercial and having any kind of IP issues there. So it's, it's a fairly open way of approaching it. And I founded that in 2010, March of two, sorry, May, I think, May of 2010, together with uh, Suzanne Gilbert, who is a, a quantum physicist um, up in Vancouver working for D-Wave. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So um, D-Wave, they've sold one of their quantum computers for a million bucks or something like that. Yeah. Ten million. Yeah. Ten million. That's, at least that's the rumored amount. I've, I was told that the actual amount was never allowed to be told or was not supposed to be made public. So wherever these amounts are coming from, and I've seen them in the press, it's probably either a rumor or something that got leaked somewhere. But um, I don't know what the actual value is. Mm. Do you know what that, that computer is being used for? Um, I've been told it's being used for some sort of validation purposes. I'm not sure what they're validating, but um, I'm sure that Lockheed Martin has some, some, some good use for it. Yeah. <laughs> cryptography, maybe? No, it's not for cryptography. I know that, in fact, the version of uh, quantum computing that they're doing, adiabatic quantum computing, um, or, or at least uh, the version that they've implemented on their chips is not actually very suitable for the um, cryptography problems, mm. but it's really mm. suitable for a whole variety of interesting natural problems that, that fit the model of, um, of quantum annealing. It's kind of like simulated annealing, but quantum annealing. Uh, so it's about optimization problems, finding optima that you're looking for in a, in a problem set. Okay. Do you think um, there'll be any quantum phenomena in the brain which we'll need to replicate or provide some sort of um, quantum sensor? Mm, I'm not sure, but my current guess, just from what I've seen about how the brain works, is no. And mm -hmm. from everything I've heard by speaking with other neuroscientists, as well as speaking to other quantum physicists, the answer is no. Mm. Cool. Well, that's you've exhausted all my questions, and there were quite some questions. So that was that's great, and it took took about an hour. Is there any uh, take home message this time you'd like to uh, provide? And, uh, oh, it's it's really not a very different take home message than the one I tried to give the last time we spoke, which is that um, I want people to understand that uh, a lot of things that we see happening uh, in science and in technology are occurring at the same time. These are not things that are happening in a vacuum. You should consider them as happening together and that because we don't want to be, let's say, left behind the technological curve or even the curve of being able to be competitive in a universe full of challenges, we need to address 
how we can benefit from those changes as well. And to properly benefit from them, you need to be able to augment and improve and modify how we think. And to do that, really, you need access to the brain. And that means, basically, we need to do substrate independent minds. And I want people to understand that it is a feasible problem, something that can be grasped as an actual physical problem you can take apart into granular pieces and work on right now. So that's something I just wanted people to understand. Excellent. So people can um, look at your work at minduploading.org and more recently at carboncopies.org. So anywhere else on the internet that people should be looking? Um, I think those are the main pages. If anything else will be linked from there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, it was a very informative interview. And, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm quite amazed at the extent of your knowledge in the subject. So it's been really good. And I'm definitely doubly looking forward to seeing your talk at the Humanity Plus Summit in Hong Kong. Yeah, it's, in it's been a very pleasant uh, interview, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, my pleasure. It's it's great to do these things. Uh, I consider myself sort of uh, lucky to you know to do all this. <laughs> all right. Well, um, yeah. Well, I'll just stop the interview here.